So here you are on the show. I'm so happy that you're here, Karen. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy life to uh, join the podcast. I'm, I've been looking forward to this because you just have this amazing presence about you. Uh, it's a, an energy. It's a spirit. You have a tremendous likability about you, a sense of fun. And I was so excited to have this opportunity to talk to you. So thanks for being on the show. No one's ever said that to me. I'm flabbergasted. Thank you very much. No, I mean it. I mean, definitely not a stranger, <laughs> but that's what you are right now. Let's see in, in, in an hour. <laughs> there you go. That's the goal of the podcast. Within an hour, can we cross that bridge from stranger to friendship? I'm absolutely positive. Thanks for having me. I'm, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. No, you really do. I, I've watched, obviously, when I have someone on the show, I love to watch other interviews that they've done or... Uh, things that are online. And you do, you just have a, a very easy smile and you have a tremendous likability. And yeah, I, it's, I'm very curious to know where that comes from. Uh, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> because people always say, I know you. And I always say, no, you don't. Yeah, I know you, you're, you're an actress. No, I'm not. I saw you on television. No, you did not. I know you played the, no, I didn't play anybody. I have that face. I don't know, but it is good when you want to go to the VIP, VIP lounge area. I right. always go through. <laughs> there you go. Walk through like you own the place and they assume that you do. Yeah. I think that's I it. I belong to this. <laughs> but, that's so a story you, and I want to stick to it. That's exactly. I would do that. I 100% would do that. So I think you're probably most known for your number one bestselling book, which is 50 Sentences That Make Life Easier, A Compass for More Inner Peace, uh, which has gotten rave reviews. So congratulations on that. That is awesome. Uh, but when I was doing research about you, in conjunction with that, one of the things that fascinated me is that you've lived a pretty darn amazing life. I mean, you were <laughs> in movies, television, radio, uh, all, and you were not just in one capacity, producer, director, on-air talent. I mean, where did this all begin and how in the world did this eventually lead us to 50 sentences that make life easier and number one on the bestseller list? Yeah, well, when did it start? Uh, it's been like this forever. Uh, I did track and field when I was young and I wasn't a high jumper or uh, I wasn't putting the, how, did, how is it called? Putting the whatever shot, shotting the put, I don't know. Yeah, shot put. Uh, I did everything, four things, five things, the older you get, the more you can do. So um, yeah, I would have done decathlon if that would have been uh, possible for women. So I think it's, it's variety. My main strength is in fact, variety. Yeah, that's it. And that's what I did. And I allowed it, you know, allowed myself to do this because everybody else always said, yeah, hello, Missy, concentrate. You know, you should know <laughs> what you want. I knew what I wanted, everything. <laughs> mm, I love that. And was that literally, can you remember that uh, from a really young age? Are you the same way? I don't know what at what mm. age you do track, but I mean, how far back does the story go? Um, I was always pointed out when I was a kid, I was pointed out like, hey, you, can you sing in the choir? Okay, this is a solo part for you. And I'm, why am I supposed to sing the solo? I never wanted this. I never wanted to stick out. I wanted to be part of the group. Mm. That's that I, I still want that, but it doesn't work like this with this. Yeah, system or whatever you want to call it. I brought with me into this life, but I always wanted to be part of something and but i stuck out and people said hey you you playing the main part you know i was six years old and i was playing the main part in a in a play and I, but i didn't want to and then they said hey radio why radio go go become uh what is it called a uh, correspondent in london for tv and i said no 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 no. i'm not in front of the camera because i didn't want to stick out so most of the time, I, pre I prevented a very successful career. That's what I did. I never wanted to write a book. I never wanted to be on telly. Uh, I was quite successful not writing a book, in fact. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> so was it the desire to be, because you said you wanted to be with others. Do you enjoy the team aspect of things? Do you enjoy working with others more than you enjoy a solo endeavor? Not at all. I, I love to do, for instance, an MC job, but I never wanted to pay the price because okay. the price would have been you lose your privacy. And I love friends and privacy. And, and that was at an, at an age or in a time when there was no uh, mobile phone or anything, you know. So if I would have known that, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. 
But no, I never quite understood why people wanted to become famous. For me, it is a horrible thing because you can never go back. It's mm. a decision. Maybe that's, oh, this is something that never occurred to me. That's a magic moment right now because, yeah, might be the case that I didn't want to say yes to something that I can't take back, you know? It's like a child. When you have a child, you have this child forever. You're the mother forever. It's not a dog that dies before you, or hopefully, hopefully not. Oh well, you know what I mean. It's 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 not a an a ter for a specific term for a specific time. It's like forever, and forever was always too big for me. Okay, I didn't want to drag that. I didn't want to hold it. it. Was too heavy. That's really amazing, and you knew that and had that sense of awareness from a very young age and yeah. like you said, uh, with, I, can, I really can't imagine to be honest with you today where with everyone having access to phones and the presence of social media and the degree to which that impacts people's lives. Uh, we were talking about that actually as a team here because to the ability to not even go to the grocery store or to go to see a movie without being mobbed by people, that would be a really tough life in my opinion. Uh, it's tough life not to have it or to have it to have it like that would that would be so the opposite of what i'd want is to have that level of exactly you know, random people stopping because, and you and i know it comes from a good place hopefully they love what you do and the rest of that but still it's just yeah i don't know that's not i wouldn't wouldn't want that on a daily basis by any stretch it's nice if it's an exception to the rule and people you know you with your hat i mean <laughs> i would have <laughs> needed a hat not to be seen <laughs> you know <laughs> but when you wear your hat that's what people see first so i would you know i could point you out from from 15000 people from behind right <laughs> um but yeah it's nice if it's an exception to the rule maybe maybe it's flattering for me no it's i never wanted this i wasn't aiming for it it's it was always in my way so to speak so i was living against my nature because the nature is hey i have an idea let's do it i'm the director here's the play bang 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 you know let's let's all have fun but no i didn't do it because i didn't want to pay the price so it was quite an interesting life so far and so then when you were because you've lived these different realities and done these different roles and been very successful in them and so does there just come a moment in the experience, like when you were a radio broadcaster, did there just come a moment where you said, and I'm done with that. I'm ready to move on to the next thing. Oh, most certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I realized I always wanted to make movies. I wanted to become a director and yeah, you know, Oscar for the best foreign film. Why not? <laughs> uh, not as an actress, but as a producer or a director, right? Because everybody knows Julia Cameron. Uh, Julia Roberts, who knows um, uh, James Cameron, only Americans maybe. He could sit here in a cafe, nobody would realize it's him, right? Right. So um, since I love movies and, and storytelling, and so, um, and I studied in uh, on New York Film Academy, so that's, that's great. And when I realized with uh, 29 that I haven't even seen a camera from, a, you know, haven't even hold held hold a camera in my hands I said okay I gotta go to America I want to I want to study film and that's when I knew okay I have to and want to quit uh, being a radio presenter and that's when I you know said to my boss in the middle of the most interesting and most uh, important uh, marketing campaign I I'm not doing it anymore I want to quit and he said are you crazy are you kidding me this is not for real right and i said yeah i want to go to america and study film and then the next day he said no 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 no. this is not going to happen next day he calls me in and he says you know what go girl go and i said why would you do that this is rather unprofessional right to let me go and he said because i want you to come back mm. and, and i loved him for this that was a really huge gesture and he was, yeah, he was big enough and big hearted enough to, to say that. And I came back, but then I was praying uh, um, to the universe, to God, to whomever is listening, <laughs> uh, that I, I'm asking for, how did I word that? I'm asking for the most, the easiest way to let go of radio. And then they closed the station. <laughs> well, your, your prayers got answered there. It was very easy. 
<laughs> but I want to backtrack a second to the the departure plan to go to the United States and go study this other thing. A lot of people have dreams and they struggle with the decision making process. And then they also struggle with the taking action. And often it's tied to fear of what's going to happen when I come back or what will be the step after that. What was your mindset as you were looking at it? Uh, and honestly, at an age where people might be saying, oh, well, gee, you've got a great job. Why would you ever leave? So where, yeah. where did you find that courage? What was your decision process like? How did you deal with that? I think it was curiosity. And I was intrigued how it works. I, I love the idea of starting all over again for 50 bucks a week. <laughs> yeah, I was that big MC. You know, I was my first job was in front of 24,000 people in uh, in Berlin, uh, an open air concert I was host, hosting. And and then I loved the idea not to, not to be anybody, just start all over again, be nobody, get 50 bucks, work 16 hours a day and just let's start it again. And that's what I did like five, six, seven times, start all over again with nothing, pure curious curiosity and 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 hunger. Uh, for life, I guess. And what do you attribute? Because that requires a certain level of fearlessness. And that fear is often what I hear in people describing that holds them back. What do you attribute to the fact that you either don't have that fear or you're able to mitigate or deal with that fear in a positive way? I just don't believe in fear. As much as I don't believe in sorrows or doubts, I think that's something we make up. Our mind makes it up and it is it is an opportunity. It is a possibility, but I don't have to follow because I, I always thought reality is, is negotiable. <laughs> and <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you're the same. I mean, when I read your story, it's like, hello. I mean, you you were you came from a different point, right? And now here you are. John Strelacki, everybody knows you. You're sitting there forever in Germany on that peak. <laughs> I remember when I when I was on number one, the first, by the way, I have to tell you this, and it's honest, it's it's a fact. The first feeling that I felt was not I'm proud or I'm happy. The first feeling was guilt <laughs> because I said, like, sorry, sorry, John, you know. I don't, I know I don't belong here. Where's <laughs> Stephanie Stahl? Oh, she's behind me too. Okay. Sorry guys, because you were there forever. Right. And that was a close chop, you know, and that was, I'm in such a great company for a year, over a year now. And it's like, who's first? Oh, him. It's her. It's, her. it's him again. Okay. Of course it's him. And, and yeah, I had to really had to turn this into joy because it was bad conscience. Uh, that was my first feeling. So my first feeling was not, my first thought was not Karen. It was John. Um, I wanted to tell you this. That's very sweet of you. And I think of it from the standpoint of the readers always. And that we, I think as someone who writes content that is designed to help people live an extraordinary life, yours is, that's the focus of my work as well. I think we're always hoping that the reader will find it at the right place at the right moment. And sometimes that is facilitated by a particular position on the bestseller list. Sometimes that facilitates somebody reading the book who actually never would have been drawn to the book. They only get it because it's number one on the bestseller list. And then they usually rip you in a review somewhere saying how it didn't work for them at all. At all. Uh, and that's the price yeah. times for that. Uh, but I think that's I think that's what everyone feels is I hope that that person's book is reaching the right person at the right moment at the right time. And so I will graciously yeah. accept that on the behalf of the fans out there who needed to find it in that moment. And if they... <laughs> <laughs> in the number one spot, Karen, they would have found it, but they didn't for that week. So hopefully they found it the week <laughs> they battled. By the way, jealousy is such an odd concept. I never understood this. Why would I be not happy for somebody else? I mean, how about gratefulness? That's that's something I would choose because it is such a tacky feeling, right? To feel, to be jealous. Uh, only It only happened twice in my life that somebody or that I know of, somebody was jealous about me uh, because of me. And it was so tacky and dirty and negative and unfair and everything all together. And if they don't do it for the sake of others, do it for the sake of yourself, because you feel better when you're grateful, right? 
Yeah, I've always felt that, well, always once I had a major epiphany around jealousy. So growing up, I would look at other people and go, wow, I wish my life was like that. Like that's, you know, I don't know how they got to where they got, but um, but then at some point I did, I had the epiphany that jealousy is really a wasted emotion. When someone has done something extraordinary, basically what they have demonstrated is the path to extraordinary. So I should be grateful for them because they've shown me yeah. that if I just do these seven, eight, 10 steps, whatever, I have this mindset or apply myself yeah. in this way that I also can achieve whatever they've achieved or get to do what exactly. they Exactly. So yeah, it should that be is, for you. Right, is what I realized. Exactly. It's a letter written for you. You know, they mm -hmm. are not the letter. They're just a postman. <laughs> it's your letter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Indeed. So I think this is really fascinating in terms of your perspectives, and I love them, and I think they're very inspiring. Do you attribute that to a particular role model in your life, uh, a family member, someone that you read about, or literally were you wired with this awareness from the time that you were just arrived on the planet? The the letter, I guess. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I just, that's just the way I'm built, probably. Okay. That's, I didn't, no, I didn't look up and say, oh, I want to become like this or that. I have a sister. She's very, very different. We had the same parents and, and she chose to be somebody else. So, no, I don't think it was a role model. It was just the, the honesty at some point, very late in my life, to admit that this is obviously, whether I want it or not, the 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 way I'm meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I was fighting against because I didn't want to be this person. I, as I said, I want to be in a group and not stand out. And, you know, this, that I, I didn't want to take a place for somebody else. When I was asked, hey, can you do the morning show? And, you know, the morning show is the show on radio, of course, because everybody gets up in the morning and you have the most, uh, the, the most listeners and, um, and and then I said instantly, no, 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 take Stefan. He's much better. You know, it's his turn. It's it's not me. I'm I'm number three or four in the row. No, no, take him. He's much better. And it was an American guy, Rick Delisle. He called himself the Alta Ami, which means the old American. And he was a, a veteran. And he said, No, Karen, I want personality. And that's that's why I I chose you and I didn't get it. I got it like 10 years later or so. I didn't, I didn't at all understand what he was saying. That's amazing. And would you say the same thing in terms of the fearlessness, which, because it's almost like you don't even describe it as fearlessness. It's just the way no. you are. But from an external perspective, I would describe it as fearlessness of I'm going to leave this and I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow this curiosity. And it could be just that you did that when you were younger and saw hey this works great like i don't have anything to worry about uh but i think ah. it's different than most people i'd be curious if you have any other perspectives on that or suggestions for someone who does struggle with that kind of decision making yeah you're right i wouldn't call it fear i wouldn't call it courage i, I don't think i'm courageous or so people always describe me oh god you're so courageous uh, yeah i would be courageous if i would feel fear and overcome it but since i don't feel it i'm just i don't know i'm just walking my path i think it is because of my father if you ask me this way i never thought of it this way you the second time that i'm thinking different thoughts here hmm <laughs> um he was a musician a jazz musician you know, and when you do a mistake, like when you're scatting, and you do the mistake and you do it twice, and then they think, oh, that's a cool twist, you know. <laughs> so so he said, when you do a mistake, do it twice or three times. That it sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, um, when we were... I don't know the word in English, but when you're holding back and when you're shy and you you don't want to sing, for instance, or so in front of people, he said, oh, come on, do me a favor, just sing. You know, it was not taken seriously, which is okay. in a way horrible that you don't take your kids seriously. And then that, that you, you know, in these days when everybody's watching the character and the personality and the growth and all this, you know, interesting and, and loving uh, angles to look at a child um, it's horrible actually if you want to judge it but at the time they didn't think about you know 
kids in this way like we do now so he just said oh come give me, give me a break just sing it for christ's sake and then i sung and so i knew no was an uh, was not an option you know okay. he wouldn't take no as an answer for an answer and and so i just did it and there's do you know pipi langstrumpf in uh, in america is Pippi? that pipi longstocking yeah, Pippi yes, Langstock. That was one of my favorite called? books when I was a kid. Loved that. All book. right. Okay. Uh, did you, you know the name? Is the, and for, I'm sure everyone who's listening who knows the story, they would know this. But if you haven't read it, the spirit that you're talking about that, oh my gosh, let's go there. And the, exactly. the, there's no hesitation. There's just pure energy, enthusiasm, happiness, total confidence. That is the Pippi Longstocking energy. And that is your energy. Exactly. And Pippi Longstocking always said, I don't have any clue how it works. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> and that's the mystery of learning. And I call it life. You know, it's development and life is development. So just go with the flow. Hello. Nobody knew how to walk until we knew. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew how to open a yogurt you know, or anything, a bottle until we did. So nobody of us knew anything until we knew it. And therefore, I don't take it so seriously. If I don't know things, well, then learn it. Because if I wouldn't have done it this way, and you, both of us, we would crawl. You know, we wouldn't couldn't sit on a chair. And we would say, oh, I never talked to an American guy on a, an American podcast, so I'm not doing it. I would have said, no, thanks for, thanks for the invitation, but no thanks, right? Because I never did it. That's my first time. So... Uh, of course, I feel much more comfortable in my language, specifically as a language person, right? Right. But hey, here I am. I don't know all the words, but so what? <laughs> I think that's a fantastic approach. I do. And the earlier in life that someone could embrace that and adopt that, I think the probably happier they would be as they progress through their life. But isn't it your approach also? Because this is how you come across that you... I wouldn't say fearless or, as I don't believe in fear and courage, but just do it. Isn't that your spirit? Very much so now, but that is not the way that I was brought up. That is not the way that I experienced uh, childhood or teenage years or the rest of that. No. And I can actually and, and trace it back through my family history. Uh, so my my grandmother was an immigrant. And when she was where five, from? Uh, from Poland, Czechoslovak. Lovaka area, so Eastern European area. I don't know exactly right. which part, but somewhere in that region. And uh, when she was just five years old, uh, her father passed away. Her mother had already passed away. And oh. she she had, I think, six brothers and sisters, and she was the youngest. And so they lived in this tiny little two-room tenement housing in Chicago. And there were, the walls were paper thin, obviously, as you might imagine. And so they put her in the one bedroom and then they were all talking in the other room, but the walls were so thin that she could hear them. And they were talking about whether they should put her in an orphanage or not. And so you can oh only, my God. as a tiny child, hearing which brother and sister said, send her away and which one said, oh no, she won't. And so uh, her whole life, she had a desperate desire to please others, to make sure that she was worth having around. And it was something mm. I realized as an adult, when I was probably in my twenties, cause I saw the same behavior in my father. And I was like, wow, what, mm. what is that? where does that come from? You know? And mm. so it's interesting how something like that can be generational in the way that it's transferred. Absolutely. It's in the cells. That's what they say. Right. So that's why you do family, whatever it's called in English family. Yeah, like constellation work. Constellation work, right. Which comes from Germany. The only thing in psychology that comes from the German side, everything else comes from America. But mind you, um, see, when you said, yeah, mind you, my parents never wanted me to even go to college. All the aims I had were like torn down. Hmm. They said, no, why do you want to go to college? Why do you want to study? What for? Do you think you're somebody better? I'm like, no, I just think that opens opportunities, right? Why film? Why don't you go to the post? Everybody needs uh, um, stamps always. Well, not anymore, <laughs> may I say. <laughs> so uh, life changed. Uh, so that it was not that they encouraged me, not at all. Oh, why? Why going to the radio? Then I was at the radio and I was that radio DJ. And then I said, hey, I, I took on a new job. I'm working now for international television. And they said, 
oh my god and if you don't succeed can you go back to radio would they take you back <laughs> that was the reaction so it's not that karen was spoiled and and you know armed with love and and uh whatever um support that's not at all the case i it's it was just this thought in myself and i was the only one in this family that i said reality is negotiable it must be negotiable there must be other ways you know well, I think that's interesting. So oftentimes when I look at people's stories and get to know them, and especially someone who asks for advice or asks for help, there is a defining moment where when you experience something, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, and you have a choice that you either embrace that, whatever it is that you've experienced, and that becomes your new norm, or you tend to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Exactly. And so whether it was you reading Pippi Longstocking or you just realizing at some point <laughs> and some age that no, there's another alternative to this and having that state of awareness, you clearly embraced, I'll go this direction instead. Thank you very much. And it'll all be fine. Yeah. Thanks for showing me. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Which sometimes I think in the role of life, that is the role of the people in our surrounding environment. They are there. They are actors in our play. And it's, I talk about this in the book, uh, Safari Disleben's Life Safari, that maybe it's all just one giant play and everybody is an actor yeah. in the play. And some of them are there to be like the supporting actor hero who boosts you when you need it. And some of them are meant to be the villain who shows you that you can go a different direction. And if they play their part poorly, you're not really inspired to go the other direction. But if they play their part to perfection, you're like, oh, hell no, I am not living my life. I'm uh, I like that. That's a very good metaphor. And some of them are extras only. And yeah. we give them the main part, although they don't have a main part. You know, when people struggle and like, uh, you know, when they sit in the car and they yell at each other or whatever, come on, he's an extra, you're an extra, don't. <laughs> don't put that energy in, you know, like uh, you decide to push your buttons, right? I uh, like so that. I've never thought of it in terms of the extras, but uh, that <laughs> is your takeaway. See, this is why, why I was in a, 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 how do you call it, assistant director. <laughs> first ad you always have to take care of the extras <laughs> yeah because it's so t that's a great point that you can either choose to create that moment and make it a major part of the story for that day or that year or you can just ah, that's an extra that's an extra moment it's just an extra moment oh i like that too i would write that down an extra moment like a magic moment that's an extra moment and it sounds even nice with the extra because <laughs> it has a double meaning i like that yeah, yeah no, that's thank you. I'm going to I'm going to carry that one with me. It's funny because uh, during these interviews, there's often something that uh, very often a guest will share something that becomes a a key phrase that's a big takeaway. And uh, yeah, this is definitely happened to me. Far thank you. Point. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, good. Uh, there was one the other day. It was uh, oh, pull a Patagonia. It was uh, this young woman was talking about the courage, the decision she made to take three months and go to Patagonia in the midst of everybody telling her it wasn't possible. And she was like, no, mm. Patagonia. And so then as you looked at her life story, you realized like that moment became defining. Once she had pulled a Patagonia, she realized it was mm -hmm. possible to pull a Patagonia a lot of times in a lot of ways in her life. And so it didn't just end up being one decision, one storyline. It became a, a character arc moment which is really cool so for her that phrase go pull a pedagogy and and what do you think john what what is it that made her say i'm going to patagonia was it like a a snapshot of it was it a time jump you know yeah that happens sometimes almost, or was it a what is it it almost always seems like there is it's it could be the inner guidance moment no doubt but it, it seems to me that there's always the inner guidance flash of awareness, and then it's coupled with something else. So going back to Pippi Longstocking, so you as a child maybe have this like, wait, this direction makes no sense. What would the 180 degree opposite direction look like? And then you're in the library, and on that day is the day that the librarian says, oh, have you read this book, right? Or your best friend recommends, and it's like, I just read this book, you got to read this. Uh, or in the case of me, when I decided I wanted to go backpack around the world, it was literally after making that decision, I got online and looked and found this website called chickenbus.com, which was someone chronicling their journey. And that was that extra little push that said, well, yeah, why not? Right. I think in terms mm -hmm. of your decision to become a, a film expert, at some point, you must have done a search somewhere and come across this opportunity in New York. And all of a sudden, the dots connected a little stronger than they were five minutes before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Life is so interesting. Maybe it is a play. Maybe we sleep. Maybe what we think is our life is, is our sleep. And when we sleep at night, that's our life. How do we know? You know, yeah. I had so many time jumps in my life. Like, for instance, I wanted to visit a friend. I've been there like a hundred times. And I took another friend because he had an open house and he wanted to be, you know, bring together creative people. So I came with my best friend and I wanted to ring the bell, but it, I didn't see his name. So I call him. Where's your name? I had some the name plate. No, it's not. Yes. Yeah, see the red thing next to the blue. I said, there's no red. No, but where are you? Then I told him I didn't know where I was. So I looked at the street names. I said, here and there. And he said, but you know, I live somewhere else. I said, yeah, where do you live? And he told me his address. And I felt like an idiot, of course. And then we got there. And three years later, uh, there was a housewarming party in his new apartment. And guess where it was? <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. That is yeah and that that is that happened to me quite some time not regularly but more and more now in mm. the last years so that i have this flashlight this and i'm like Whoa, what was that a time jump and um this is so interesting because we know so little we know we think we know so much i know that i don't know anything uh i know little things you know and i leave it up to the life and to up to up to fate or whatever you want to call it, karma, I don't know, that, that life surprises me in a way I, I do not even know. So what do you- I, can, I can't is, even imagine, sorry. This is not the first time I've heard of time jumping, actually. There's a, an amazing place in here in the United States called the Monroe Institute. And it's funny that we're having this conversation because literally I have not picked up this book in 20 years. And I picked it up about three weeks ago and started rereading it by this guy, Robert Monroe. And he- uh, I write that down. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the last one is called Ultimate Journey. I can't remember. He wrote. He wrote three books about his experiences. But basically, and the institute's name is Monroe. Can you say that again? Yeah, Monroe. M O N R O E Institute. Institute. And oh. He started to have these moments of spontaneous being out of his body, and he mm. was freaked out by this. This was in the 1950s. There was no talk of spirituality. There was no talk about like your other presence, any of that. And so he thought he was dying. And so he went to all the medical professionals. Nobody could find a cure for him. And so as he was doing, and he was in the field of radio, actually. And so he, over time, figured out that if he could produce sounds in one ear and a different sound in the other ear, that his brain would balance out the two realities and it would help him maintain his normal C state. But it would also open his unconscious to being able to go outside of his normal state. So fascinating, mm. fascinating dude, fascinating story and fascinating place. But in those writings, he talks about time jumping. And there was another mm. who he helped who also had this ability to time jump and would describe something very similar where he would, uh, he was working in the military intelligence and they would give him an envelope and ask him to describe what was in the envelope. And he would describe it and they would say, no, you're wrong. And he's like, no, I, I am 100% sure I'm right on this one. And then they'd say, no, you're wrong. And like, here's what it is. And he would say five years later, he would drive by that intersection. And there was the thing that he saw five years earlier. Wow. Look it kind of makes you go, whoa. So what does that mean? Right. I mean, we, we it probably time. means it probably means that we are not humans making a spiritual, you know, this saying, right. Uh, are we humans make, who make a, a spiritual, um, uh, what is the word in German? I don't even know that one. Um, <laughs> Erfahrung. What is that file? Experience? Spiritual experience. Got yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or are we spiritual beings making uh, a human experience? Right. And I think that's the case. We are spiritual beings making a human experience. So uh, I have a gazillion questions about your book, but I have to ask one more about the time jumping because this is so cool. I've only met a couple yeah. of these. So is it something that you foster or facilitate in any way, shape, or form? Or is it just part of you and when it happens, it happens and you don't give it much thought? That's after. just me. When I talk with my mom, it's um, a lot of times I, she doesn't say anything and I answer it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she's in a different room. And then I say, because that's the way I wanted it. And she's like, what did you think I was thinking? I said, well, you were just asking me why I put the shelf there. Yes, I said. Well, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but she so, had or, 
Yeah. Uh, or how her, her mother was the same and her grandmother was more like this, more, 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 much more than, than uh, my tendency, let's say. I did, I gave a workshop the other, like a couple of weeks ago, it's called Your Best Version with 220 people. So quite a lot of people, because usually I gave workshops with 10 people, right? And two weeks before, when I wrote the nameplates, because I love to write the nameplates with my own hand, huge nameplates, you can take them home because on the backside, it's a lovely saying, and they hold it up so I can say, not the woman in the red shirt, but hey, Susanna, right? I like that. It's more, it's much more close. Um, yeah, so, and I wrote those nameplates and then I said, oh, who said him back there on the right side? Who's back there? Who's it? Okay, she's she's struggling. Ooh, she doesn't want to she doesn't want to participate. Who is that? Hmm, interesting energy. You know? And then I started the workshop, and in the very first um, exercise, somebody in the very back on the right side uh, didn't didn't do the the wonderful, by the way, um, exercise because it's a love shower. You cannot lose. You three people are telling you for three minutes how great you are, right? So that's something you don't want to miss. And I couldn't see it when I wrote the nameplates two weeks before. Is it a man or a woman? Couldn't tell. And when I was in the room, I knew right away because I, why I couldn't tell because it was so far away that I didn't know this person with a short haircut. Uh, is it a man or a woman? And then I, then I um, walked in the, in the audience and I said, hi, how are you then? How are you doing? And she said, I don't want to do it. I said, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and ever since she changed. And then the last, on the last day, she said in the first row and was overwhelmed. So she found her lust and her, uh, her joy to participate. So that was another time jump. I didn't know that, that I couldn't tell because she was just sitting so far in the back. That's what I didn't know, but I knew I want to talk to her. And I talked to her two weeks earlier. Therefore, I didn't have to talk to her in front of everybody else. Quite tricky. I love that. And this you, this capacity, this ability, you said that you were, did you know your grandmother? No, my grandmother, yeah, yeah, yeah. She turned uh, 93. Um, yeah, I knew her. But the, the, the one was her mother. And she was in mm -hmm. the fields in the Second World War. And then all of a sudden, she... She let her basket, you know, she, she let go of her basket and she yelled and she cried and everybody said, what is happening? She said, he died. He died. They, they, um, they pulled him down. He was a, uh, a pilot, her son. And uh, two weeks later, here is the tele telegram or telegraph or whatever you called it in the old days and said exactly on this day, he was shot and died. Hmm. Wow. I mean, it, it opens up the very interesting questions of exactly what is the human experience. And so very cool that you have not just a concept of that, but you have firsthand experiences with that. And Yeah, not very often, but enough right. to believe in it. Right, right. So I'm curious then, because I didn't know that part of your story at all, if that is in any way, shape or form connected with the work that you do, because your book, uh, the 50 Sentences book, uh, is very, very transformative for a lot of people in a very an interesting and beautiful way, in my opinion, in that these sentences, we think of, oh, that might be seven words or nine words or 12 words or whatever. So that's a sentence, but it's way more than that when you oh, yeah. embrace and understand the things that you talk about in your book. And so I'd love for you to just explain where the concept for the book came from and, and how you brought it to life. And also if there is any tie-in back to this kind of awareness that you have, I'd be very curious to know that since I didn't know that part of your story. I think the awareness is not part of the book at all. The book was just pure pleasure in the end, not in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> pleasure of telling short stories because I love shortcuts. I don't have any, I could never run a marathon. This is not me. I like short things. Yeah. I could have never written a book like you wrote your book, it is a story, it's storytelling, yes, and you packed your pr profound and spiritual thoughts about life in, in that story, right, in, on this place, 
uh, it happened in this place and there were people, you know, you, you could have written it like life is about this ding, 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 nonfiction book, right? But you chose a different, a different way. Although it's a nonfiction book, it is fiction, right? Right. Right. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's very interesting to see you sitting at this cafe because of course I'm thinking, oh, that's the cafe. Oh, that's <laughs> what it looked like. Oh my God, I saw it wrong. <laughs> so no, Everybody, the book is not. Is, everybody's version appears a little different to them. So it's okay, no matter what version you see in your head, it's the right one. I probably saw this corner that you don't show. There you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with a lounge and everything. Um, no, this is not part of the book. The book is um, made out of pure impatience because I couldn't listen to myself anymore. I said it all over again. For 23 years, I was a performance coach for Business Stage and Life. I worked with a lot of uh, influ people with influence, and um, which is good because then I don't only coach them, but you know all their the, the team members too, because it's always a system. It's like a little mobile, right? You pull here and the whole mobile sure. moves. Do you say mobile in English? I, yeah, I yeah, I know right. what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Mobile, different ball game in our language. So um, yeah, and, and I was so impatient because I couldn't hear myself talking anymore. Always the same, same things and always the same hints. And so, and everybody always said anyway, uh, where is it all written? And I said, nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura Sila, your good friend Laura, she put me into this because she said you should write a book. And I said, no, 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 no. And yes, no, no, yes, no. End of the story. To to cut a long story short, I said, uh, yeah, I have 10 books in my drawer anyway, and, and, and 15 ideas of card decks, and no problem. Well, here she comes. You, she takes people seriously and for granted, that's for sure. So <laughs> she wrote an email to the publisher saying, hi, here's a great new author. She has 10 books in her drawer. I'm like, didn't I say concepts? <laughs> <laughs> and 15 card decks, didn't I say ideas? <laughs> <laughs> and so next thing that happens, the lecturer calls me, like the editor calls me like, hi, I heard you have 10 books in your drawer. Which one do you want to? pitch first and I'm like uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. thanks Laura yes thanks for asking yeah what's it called again <laughs> and since I worked with a lot of uh, um how do you call it all these little uh, papers you put somewhere I don't know uh with a white wall and I had papers all over the place yeah, like and post notes on the wall was your post it right yeah. right thank you the post it and when one post it said 50 cents to simplify your life and I turned it around because I didn't know what it meant, what I meant with this. It's 50 sentences to simplify your life. What is it all about? And then little stories about the coaching thing. <laughs> and that's what I read in, in, in interesting words, I hope. Uh, so that she said, oh, I want to have this book. Actually, I want to give it away as a present. I'm like, you don't even know it. She said, you haven't even written it. And I'm like, cool. Oh. <laughs> so that's how it started. She was time you know? jumping. She could envision the time when she handed it to someone and they came back and were like, this is the best book ever. Probably, yes, because she's a fairy. I'm telling you, she is, she's a fairy. She's really great and, and very light and energetically fulfilled, whatever you want to call it. Radiant, definitely. And so she's an angel. The 50 things that you talk about in there, the 50 sentences, the 50 concepts, mm -hmm. did those flow through you? Were those moments that you had had epiphanies yeah. over the course of your life previously? Uh, so I guess my my question is, how much of it was creation after you decided to write the book and how much of it was already inside of you based on life experiences that you just then took the time to sort out and say, oh, that's one of the ones I'm going to include? All of them were inside of me, all of them but two. Two sentences are new to me or have been new to me because I had 48 and I needed 50, of course. And I guess it's a nicer <laughs> figure, right? Not nicer number. So I asked a flight attendant um, who is a friend of mine and I said, hey, do you have a cool sentence? And actually, I have to think about it. Oh, I wrote it down, I guess. Let me have a look because I don't know, 23. So I'm sorry if I gave you the impression you could talk to me like that. <laughs> That's his sentence, you know, because he was in handy as a flight attendant too. Yeah, because he's first class flight attendant. You know, when people are 
you know, disbehaving and they think they can do it because they paid 8,000 bucks or whatever. Right. Um, then, then they lose their temper and the tone and whatever, you know, they get angry or want a, a bossy and stuff. So he then said in the, in the nicest flight attendant's um, tonality, um, I'm sorry if I made the, what, what is it? Um, I'm so sorry if I gave you the impression that you could talk to me like that. You cannot. Thank you so much. <laughs> walked away and I was like, what the heck? So I can totally picture was... that scene as you're demonstrating it too. Like the person, the person who he was talking to, I mean, what was going on inside their head at that moment? Hopefully like, oh gosh, I was a big ass. Sorry about that. Yeah. People are quiet when you say that. And he was quiet too. And he said, he then said, was that a a threat? Was that a, are you arguing with me? He said, no, I'm just telling you, thank you so much for listening. You know, in this <laughs> unlikely event of a loss in Kevin pressure, oxygen right. mass will automatically drop <laughs> yeah, in this tone. You exactly, know? exactly. Oh my, so, well, that we're hearing that conversation literally must have been busting a gut laughing because, you know, it's pretty obvious when you're surrounding that situation, you can tell who's the big jerk. And, you know, you feel right. like, obviously for the flight attendant or the passengers. I have a guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so those those were not inside of me. I didn't, uh, I, they were totally new to me. He explained me how it worked and I then created a story and it was really fun to write it down because I could be creative, you know, like you and your stories, I could be creative. I could create something. It's not a story I particularly um, experienced, but all the other stories I experienced, it just made a man a woman uh, uh switzerland is austria and italy right. is germany so that because you know obviously uh, as a coach you 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 want to be silent about your clients do you have a favorite one or two that you go back to on a regular basis just in the everyday life experiences that you have that you tend to default back to those or they come to the forefront or even just a particular favorite, either because of the way that you discovered it or the way it just sort of rings true for you? Yeah, this one I like very much. But what I use often is the uh, talk to myself. Is It's that what I said earlier on, uh, I decided to push my buttons. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, interviewed a guru, a very well-known, huge guru in India. And uh, he once said to me, uh, when I said, oh my God, did I just insult the guru? That's what I said, because he was talking and talking and talking, but I would, my question was totally different. So I said, excuse me, may I interrupt? Um, what I really wanted to know is this and that. And then he looked at me like, you really want to talk to me like this? And I was, oops, like this. And then I said, did I just insult the guru to the audience? Right. <laughs> and then he said, I would never give you the privilege to do so. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I said, I would never give you the privilege to insult me. Hello? <laughs> yeah, that's about setting boundaries in a very positive, self-confident, um, self-guidance or whatever you want to call it way, because that means I don't give my power away to other people that they can decide how I feel or how long I, uh, I'm awake at night. Or when I fall asleep, I decide when I want to fall asleep, I decide whether I want to become angry or not, or whatever I want to think about. So those boundary sentences are quite, quite interesting to me. And I love that sentence. Um, I'll forgive myself right now. When when something happens that I don't like, and today it was something I, I hit the wrong tone. I, 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 I know I could do better, but I couldn't. And at this specific time, I couldn't, uh, I was into it and she was into it. We were both into it. And then later on, I went back to my apartment and then I said, oh, I forget my, give myself right now. And then I felt much better. And then I went to her and I said, Hey, that's all I got. Those were my hundred percent, believe it or not, I could do better, but this is all I got at this specific moment. I'm very sorry. Yeah. And we embraced each other. And that was good. You, I'm a human being. She's a human being. We, well, at least say sorry. You know? Yeah. That, that, I'll tell you what, that is one of the most underestimated words out there, to genuinely apologize when you jack something up. Um, one exactly. of my favorite things that I ever taught my daughter was that I said, you know, things are going to go wrong. You're going to make mistakes. That's part of life. If you're not making mistakes, it means you're not comfortable pushing the envelope enough. 
And I said, but when we make exactly. them, I remember having this conversation when she was like three. So it's just such a beautiful picture in my head because I can picture her tiny little face and tiny little essence. And I said, uh, when we make a mistake, we do four things. Um, the first thing is we say we're sorry and we really mean it when we say it. And then the second thing is we own it. We say that was my fault, right? And then accept responsibility. That was my bad, right? So that was my fault. That was my bad. And then we fix it. So that's the third thing that we do. We Whatever we broke, we fix. Whatever mistake we made, whatever damage we did to someone else, whether it was hurt their feelings or whatever, like we, we repair the damage, right? That's our job. And then the last step wow. is then you move on. And, you know, it's funny because when you're helping a child- I let go, right? You move, do you mean like, by let, uh, yeah, move let on, let go? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, it's funny because when you're sometimes in the role of parents and teaching the child something, you realize, oh, actually- I should really be writing this down for myself. <laughs> that whole letting go step. Wow. I think I may yeah. need to go back in my timeline. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hit step four a few times on some of the key variables there. Um, but that, yeah. that's awesome. And I would imagine that because of the profoundness of the words that you've shared with these sentences and the stories associated with them, I bet you have some amazing stories that people come back with in terms of the yes. way they impact them. What I love about this book is the response I get from, from nearly everybody. They always say, I tried the sentences, they work. It was much easier than I thought. Mm -hmm. So they surprise themselves, which is great because then you open a new window and you're more open-minded and, you know, um, and that they did it because I don't want to write a book about knowledge. I'm not interested in knowledge. We're giants in knowledge. And what do we bring, you know, down the road? I mean, w w put it into action. It, it, for me, something only counts if you bring it into action. If you just know it, I don't care. Woody Allen does know he shouldn't have married his uh, daughter, but he did, you know. <laughs> so what does that, I mean, really, what, what, what does that stand for? It doesn't mean anything. You know it, and so what? Yeah, no, that's you, a great perspective. We, yeah, do you behave as if you know it? That's do you treat yourself as if you know it? That's that's important for me. So I wanted to do something and bring something to the world and and yeah, that that really makes a difference, really. And it does. And that's very nice. And I like your story with your daughter. How old is she now? Uh now she's she was 16. yeah. 16. 16. And yeah. does she, can she remember that story when she was three and you told her? Or did uh, I don't know if she remembers the very first time, um, but uh, I will tell you one real quick one. And then I want to talk about your coaching because uh, we were talking offline briefly and you do this thing that sounds Sorry. Really cool, which is, <laughs> but it's interesting. but, I, but I, <laughs> I do have a great story and it's related to words, which is so beautifully tied to the genius, one of the geniuses that you add to the world. Um, but when she was little, one of the expressions I used to share with her was don't let the small things keep you from the big things. And so- right. At one point when she was four and a half, uh, we were talking about taking a year and backpacking around the world because I really wanted her to be as world exposed as possible. I thought if I can do that at a young age, then her perception of what's possible in life, her perception of um, entitlement or gratitude, all of that I thought would shift dramatically because it shifted for me and I didn't do it until I was in my 30s. And so off we get ready to go. And one of the places we're going to go is Africa. And, you know, she was an avid reader, loved animals. And I had been hyping Africa to no end because I love it. And then she learned that she had to get a shot and she had to get numerous shots in order to go to Africa because you have to get yellow oh. fever and you have to get the rest of these. And so I remember telling her because I, I learned very early on that it would it would go better if I set expectations. You don't want to show up at the doctor's office and be like, oh yeah, you have to get five shots. Like that's going to result in a screaming kid. Yeah, that's yeah. Unhappy. And so the day before I said, okay, okay, boo. So tomorrow in order to get ready to go to Africa to see the lions and the elephants, we're going to go get our shots. You're going to get yours and I have to get mine too. And she started to cry. And I said, I know. Mm. I said, I'm right there with you. I don't like shots either. And I said, but you know, this is one of those times where we can't let the small things keep us from the big things. And the mm -hmm. shot, I get it. I know it'll hurt for a couple seconds and that's going to be the small thing. But the big thing will be that we get to go to Africa and we get to see all the animals, right? 
And so sure enough, we go to the doctor's office and brave face on, she gets her shots. And then we go out for ice cream afterwards because now we're Africa ready. That was my like- Sure. <laughs> but the, the marvelous moment that came out of this that was completely unexpected. So that worked out fantastic. And I was super proud of her and, and the rest of that. So the next year she comes back and she goes to kindergarten and I go in for parent teacher conferences and the kindergarten teacher pulls me to the side and she says, I have to tell you this story. She said, last week, there was a little girl who was very sad and she was crying about something. And your daughter walked up to her and put her arms around her shoulder. And she said, I know you're sad right now, but we can't let the small things keep us from the big things. <laughs> oh just, my God. Oh my God, it melted my heart. It was one of my all-time mm. favorite stories of the words Jesus. and how a single small little phrase goes way beyond us and has an impact on a broader scale. So, yeah. Yeah, because it's not a single simple sentence. It's a very deep sentence and that you made it come across in a light, easy way. And that's what people like to take. Make deep, profound content sound easy because mm. then we we want to have it. And we then we think we can get it. Then it's can, to your point, it's actionable then. Digest it, yeah. Mm. I love Should. it. Nice. Uh, so I want to hear about this coaching methodology because we talked a tiny bit offline and it sounded absolutely amazing. So I'm going to shift gears uh, a little bit here. And so okay. you've done a ton of coaching. I know that. I'm curious what drew you to the work in general, uh, but also I'm very curious to know about the methodology you created of this listen and learn because this this is <laughs> to my interest. So as much as you feel called to share, I would love to hear about this. Yeah, for 23 years, I gave workshops and coachings in business uh, surroundings, in conference rooms, in a castle, in some interesting offsite sceneries. And then I had enough of it. And, um, and again, since I love shortcuts, I thought, hey, I don't need 90 minutes. A lot of the times I don't need 90 minutes. And internet helped, uh, actually, uh, Instagram helped me with it because you only could talk 59 seconds, right? <laughs> when you wanted to leave uh, an audio message to somebody, a direct message. And people were constantly sending me direct messages like, hey, what do you say? What? Do, how would you solve this? Do you have a sentence for this? How? What should I say here? What should I answer? And I said, oh, God, I cannot answer everybody. But when I answered, it was an audio message. And I only had 59 seconds. And I said, okay, do this, ding, dong, 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 dong. And solved. And then they called and or they they talked to or they wrote and they said, oh, my God, it worked. <laughs> I really got more money and I really solved this problem with my neighbor or whatever else it was. And then I thought, hmm, wait a minute. And the idea, the idea of Germany's first uh, speed coaching was born. I call it listen and learn. A lot of people are listening and seven people learn specifically by being online in a Zoom conference with their face. And they have 10 minutes time. Actually, I have 10 minutes time <laughs> um, to, um, to solve whatever it is they want to have a solution for. So they quickly um, pitch their issue and then the clock runs and uh, after nine minutes like when you're too long and the oscars you know like dee, 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 the, <laughs> yeah, the music the music starts sending you off right exactly and that's here the same i said let's do it like the oscars do it you know and nine minutes in i want to hear that sound a jingle whatever it is music and then her, her my most of the times it's uh, women by the way it jumping in only two times i had a speed coaching a hot seat with a guy all the others are women they dare and yeah then we know okay one minute to go and funny enough when i ask then okay do you need anything else for us to finish this conversation no uh, is your problem solved more than this it's never been the case that somebody said yeah but no they didn't but me ever <laughs> and this is what what I what I also did on stage, where, because when you do it on stage, you know, there's 200 people watching, it's a different ball game, and then people are lining up, and they come on stage, and then ding, you know, here comes the gong, and then then 10 minutes, and the violins, and then okay, thank you so much, wow, you know, and then they like, oh my god, and everybody's like, 
everybody's uh, happy for them and and there's a lot of tears of relief actually not because anybody's sad relief tears yeah mm -hmm. that was very touchy very overwhelming also for a lot of people and of course for me it's a uh, very profound to me for a lot of different reasons one is the fact that when there is a time allocation like that even as the person explaining this is what i'm dealing with mm. you'd be driven to explain it as quickly as concisely as coherently as possible because you want to then give you the opportunity to share okay here's how i get beyond that that alone can right. be a tremendously powerful experience of having to really narrow down what i'm dealing with because i think a lot of times our minds will cycle it's crazy right yeah, yeah yeah the fact that you're there with a certain allocation of time I would imagine it kicks your brain into hyper mode too. Like, okay, we got no time to waste on this. So let's connect all the appropriate dots. And it's funny because the way you described your interest in jumping to different careers, I can see why this would be entertaining for you because you never know what you're going to get into and you never know what you're going to be challenged with. And exactly seems to fit your personality perfectly. Interesting. You're saying this for the third time in this podcast. <laughs> this is like, I never saw it this way. Yes. It, the shoe fits. Yeah. The shoe fits. It's it's probably matching my personality. And that's probably the reason why I'm never um, excited or, oh my God, what comes next? And I'm always like, ah, oh, hot seats. When it comes to the third day, you know, on this best, my best version uh, life event, my team and the rest of the people, the participants, they say, oh my God, fingers crossed, you know, they're, now they're the nervous, seats. but you're not at all. Yeah, I'm not at all. I'm like, oh, thank God the hot seat because I'm relaxed. I'm just in the moment. I'm just in the presence of now. I don't even think about the clock. I don't I don't think about I trust. The only thing I do is be in the moment, uh, trust, being confident that the the solution is in the room anyway. I don't have the solution. She or he has the solution anyway. I'm just the gold digger who who wants to find the nugget. And, and uh, yeah, and I do find it. And that's nice. And if you, if you know, don't push the river. That's what you've been told when you become a coach. Don't push the river. Never, you know, make it faster than because people need their own space. Yeah, could be. I know. But sometimes it's just like, come on, give me a break. Sometimes it's just like, bring it to the point, just point. Yeah. And then I bring it to the point and then we see what's left behind. And most of the time, nothing's left behind. Yeah, because some people just know the, some people just need the allowance to yesterday, there was somebody who, who didn't make it to the hot seat, but I, but I promised her a hot seat. So I did it on phone without zoom, without a listen and learn format. And she just said something, da, 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 da. She promised her boss, this and that. And now, now it doesn't count anymore. I'm like, well, then change your mind. And she, what do you mean? I said, yeah, you obviously changed your mind. Well, tell him, tell him, remember when I promised you this and that, as life went on, I, I'm realizing now I'm a different person. So I want to take it back. It doesn't count anymore. I changed my mind. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so easy. Yeah. But, but a lot of people need the allowance. Can, can I say that? Do you think I can say that? I'm like, of course you can say that. It's, it's called life. It's, you cannot be the same person like 15 years ago. You, you changed your mind. He changed your mind. Everybody changes their mind. But it is on us to to uh, state the obvious and, and, and formulate it and, you know, put it into words. I love this uh, methodology or process so much and for so many reasons. And I think probably one of the biggest ones is, as you described it, people talking about don't push the river. The definition of how fast the river needs to move may not be what we've always been led to believe. And your process, your methodology now is suggesting mm. that it's actually running at a different speed potentially with the right infrastructure, with the right setting, like the river mm. can be at a very, very different speed. And wow, I mean, how spectacular that is for someone who may have been struggling with a problem for a long time and hasn't been able to get yeah. there to know that it's not going to require a year's worth of effort, but in truth, it actually might be done exactly. the best. Yeah, sometimes you just need the allowance from a stranger like me that you can change your mind and you just have to say it out loud and that's it. And when people do it, then it's a chapter, by the way, I changed my mind, just realized. 
uh, the the uh, experience they make is very positive because then on the other side the the, um, the the other guy says oh really like and you you do it just like that yeah uh okay and what does it mean for me i don't know i just wanted to tell you <laughs> you know it's just you don't right. deliver you know well, and, and I, it's funny because I was picturing the setup with the seven people on stage. And so not only is the information useful for the person who's receiving it, but everybody who's listening is taking something away from that as well. And everybody in the audience as well. And so for that person in the scenario you were describing where it's the boss being told, I changed my mind. It's like, well, what do I do? Well, you could allow yourself to change your mind from this point going forward also. <laughs> it's exactly. not just it's I, just not just a present for me. The nugget isn't just mine. We all get the same nugget. Exactly. And I totally underestimated this when I started it. It's like, oh my God, are aren't they all bored? It's not their subject. And um do I because I'm so much used to entertain or not entertain, but to think about the audience, to make it easy for them, to make it nice for them and so yeah. That I thought, ooh, I hope they don't get bored, but the listeners were the ones who uh, gave me the most uh, beautiful um, feedback because they said, oh my God, I wrote books, 10 pages, you know, I wrote everything down. Uh, it was not my subject, but my neighbor and my mm -hmm. mom and my brother and my best friend have that I wanted to tell them, or uh, now I can, I know I do understand my employees better. Because I've said, I have somebody in the team who's like this, and I it would have never occurred to me that somebody could be like this personality you just had on the hot seat. So, yeah, it, it's it is quite a, an interesting format, and for me, it's a it's a home run. It's it's really life because uh, light because I don't push myself, I don't put myself under pressure, I don't feel pressure at all. It's it's life. I can only give hundred percent. That's all I have anyway. You know, if I don't have a solution, maybe that happens at some point. Well, then that's my sentence. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> you're my first one. Thank you for the experience. Now I know what it feels like not to have a solution. Right. All I can do. Right. What's the worst? The worst is not so worse. You know, it's just then the way it is. I guess. I love have it. Never happened, but you know. <laughs> right. And it may never happen, but if it does, I think that's a great frame of reference to have on it. And, uh, I'll forgive myself right now. Forgive yourself <laughs> <in that moment. laughs> Ahead of time. Preemptive forgiveness, if necessary, to be cashed in. Uh, yeah. So I, I appreciate your time. We've spent a lot of time and this has been an awesome conversation. I have two more questions for you or just one call out, I guess. And then one, one more question, um, which is you have a, a second book that came out, which is 200 small stories about big topics. Um, and so for everyone who loved 50 sentences that make life easier, check out the new book as well, because that obviously is going to expand on the amazing things that you're creating. And I wanted to tie that in to the comment that you made before that in your drawer, you have like book ideas, you have movie scripts, <laughs> et cetera. I'm just curious, is there either, does movie writing itself interest you or is there something else just over the horizon that you just can't quite glimpse yet, but you know it's there and you get the sense that at some point you're going to walk over that hill and, and sort of head off in, on that adventure. Um, given the fact that you've got these things sort of in the drawer, is there some other part of you that is waiting to uh, go off in a, in a new direction? Definitely movies. Uh, I think I would love to write a script because I love dialogues. I think I'm quite good at it. Um, I had a lot of actors in my as as clients in my career, and I I just always loved movies. So a big one, maybe a feature film, and maybe a TV series, and maybe listen and learn. Is I always had this feeling, not that I want it, it's not my aim or so, but I always had the feeling it's going to be big, much bigger mm. than I think. I don't know in what way. I don't have a plan. I actually don't want to have a plan because I, I, I love life to surprise me. It's just an intuition that I think something is in it there. Something is in it. I don't know what it is. And uh, definitely a child's book. 
Oh, there's so many. I don't know. I don't like, <laughs> I have to admit, I don't like writing. I just never liked writing. Yeah, I, I like, I don't dislike reading. That's why I listen to your book. By the way, it's a good speaker in German, <laughs> the cafe. And then I bought the book afterwards because I needed to, wanted to read it then. Yeah. Um, but I'm an audio person. So yeah, audio books is a great, ach, there's so many things, but I, I'm pretty sure it's something huge. And I can't even, I just can't feel it. I cannot describe it. That's all right. I can see that. It's just, just over the horizon. We're getting a glimpse of it so far. Yeah. At some point you'll walk. That was a the perfect uh, wording. Yes. Thank you. But uh, funny, as you were describing that, and I'll sort of close with this, and that as you were talking about the coaching model that you're doing, and as I am more and more familiar with the 50 sentences uh, and the other works that you do around this importance of the words that we use and the way they can change our life. I could totally see that as content that I absorb. Now, my initial flash was of a TV show, sort of watching it live. Uh, but then when you were describing audio, it hit me even harder that no matter what I would be doing, I could be listening to this person talk about the challenge that they're experiencing and then talk about, excuse me, and then hear you talking about your reaction to that. And man, oh man, I can only imagine how much personal growth I or anyone else could have of listening to 20 versions of that or 50 versions of that. And the fact that I can yeah. anywhere on audio would be really profound. So I have no idea. I don't, I don't know if that's big enough for the big thing that you have, but that would be pretty It's strange. quite big, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And also the the little stories about big to or tall topics. This is all a collection. It's a treasure box. It's like a collection of alms, one minute messages. And that's why it's 222 messages. Um, those were audios. Because I only send audios, I only post audio. I don't do uh, reels or videos at all, exception to the rule, okay, excluded. But usually I talk because I like to talk. I don't like videos. This is an exception to the rule also, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a camera girl. I'm, I'm so much more into microphones. <laughs> and yeah, maybe, maybe, baby, there is a 22... Uh, 222 stories reloaded, you know, 3.0, whatever. Something like this, something with audio. It's funny that you're saying it. That's what that's what's my feeling is. Yeah, and of course, there is uh, another book on hold, which <laughs> is uh, which is the 50 sentences in a total different way, but very close. Fantastic. Well, I know that everyone out there is looking forward to those when they do decide to manifest themselves through your efforts. Um, but <laughs> I want to, uh, give you the opportunity. I, you know, I'm sure that people are listening to this and say, oh, I would love to learn more about that. I'd love to participate in a listen and learn, or I would love, love to sort of tap into this awareness. What is the best way for people to stay connected with you? What's your preferred source of reaching out and connecting with people? Well, listen and learn is definitely a great jumpstart kickstart to enter my world. And, uh, because there you can really, really <laughs> touch base and and have a depth in a in a very light way i okay. like that combination depth light um instagram of course that's that's where i send the arms the one minute messages as an audio and yeah come to the life events because life event is going to happen first weekend in june in berlin because people always said why don't you come to nuremberg why don't you come here you know why i moved my whole life for everybody now I want you to move for me. <laughs> I wonder really where she's at. And is the, that's, I take it that's on your website. That's the best place for them to find information about the upcoming Karen event. KarenCushley.com. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Well, my, I didn't know you before this. I am so honored that we got the chance to spend this time together. I've enjoyed the conversation immensely. As I said at the beginning, you have an essence, you have a radiance about you that comes through instantly. And uh, I can uh, say that a thousand times even more so now because this has been a genuine pleasure. Thank you so much for what you do for the world. Thank you for the contributions you make and all the people that you help. And uh, I just wish you the best of luck in all the stuff that you have going and that will be going when you open up that drawer and decide to write the movie script or walk over that hill and see whatever is there. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you for your show. great impact. And thank you for being such a wonderful, grateful, uh, opening, welcoming host. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Take care.